All right. Hello, everybody. As people continue to filter in, I'll give a brief introduction to myself and our organization. Um, my name is Pambe, and I am a neuroscientist at the University of South Florida by day and national director of Taste of Science by night and pretty much every weekend. Um, we are a nationwide uh, science festival, and we create uh, hopefully fun and engaging events for an adult audience. And usually we have a big in-person festival at the end of April, bringing scientists and those in related fields out to have conversations with anybody who wants to join us. Uh, but for now, we invite you to join the only place we seem to be able to meet, and that is online. Um, we are a wholly volunteer run organization and we love what we do, but this year we lost our biggest source of income. So if you like what you see, please consider going to tasteofscience.org and hitting the donate button. Um, for tonight's event, we are very pleased to be collaborating with uh, a group of women mathematicians uh, to present to you a kind of two part today. Uh, the first will be speaking to the mathematicians themselves and all um, keeping fingers crossed uh, that our live stream of the movie is going to work for the second part of the show. Um, we like everybody to be able to participate, so hopefully you will have found the chat section already. Uh, please feel free to engage with each other, let us know uh, what you, where you are, uh, how you got interested in this particular event. Um, and please feel free to ask questions we, uh, throughout. We have a moderator who's going to be answering general math questions for you. Um, and of course, if you have uh, questions for our guest today, uh, let us know specifically who you would like us to refer those to. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen now. Uh, this event comes courtesy of my friend and colleague Anna, who I will introduce now. Uh, she is um, she is a mathematician, obviously. Uh, she enjoys algebra and cryptography, and she is also very passionate about sharing mathematics with other people in a fun way, um, including to the point where she has created mathematical musicals when she was still working in France. Um, I hope we get to hear more about that later. But for now, I will hand over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Parmir, for this nice introduction. By the way, since uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of decoration in my house, I just put here some of the posters uh, of uh, musicals that we have organized in France. So I want to welcome everybody. And uh, I hope you are doing great and probably having a a drink behind your screen. So um, I want to recall that this is a one hour event, more or less, which is followed by the screening of a beautiful film. So I strongly suggest you to stay until the very end. So most probably you will also have to make some, pop some popcorns at some time. So my name is Anna and I want to say that this is a first experience for me as a, um, as, a, as a speaker for an online event. So the good thing is that uh, we really can reach people all over the world. And I think that tonight there are people also joined from Europe. So please, if you are they, there, say hi to us. And these are mostly my friends, okay, which are supporting me. Um, but uh, uh, on the other side, I'm kind of sad that I cannot see your reaction. So I don't know if you are laughing to my jokes or uh, if you're just sleeping behind your screen. So in that case, I would like to wake you up. So but in any case, uh, uh, you have the chat for writing all the comments, say, tell me what you like, what you don't like. I will be able to watch at them at the end of my talk. It's kind of difficult to focus to both on the same time. So. Tonight, it is really not important who I am and what is my affiliation. So for you tonight, I want to be just a woman and a mathematician. And as a mathematician, I am both 
a teacher and a researcher. So uh, I would like to start by sharing a picture with you. So let's hope that this works. So this is a picture that has been taken in France, specifically in Rennes, in the northwest of France, in August 2019. And I was attending this workshop, which is called Women in Numbers. And this is the European version. There is also an American version. Basically, the idea of this workshop is to bring together people, women mathematicians from all over the world. In this particular case, they were working all in number theory, which is uh, one of my, uh, the fields in which I do my research. And so, you are divided into groups and then you are assigned uh, specific projects and basically you work together with this group of women mathematicians and you have to know that this is a very rare experience uh, in, uh, the, uh, in academia and especially in the field of mathematics because you will always have some male collaborator and it's not that male collaborators are not nice, but it's definitely a different experience sometimes to work together with women and uh, you are kind of more free to express uh, yourself. So this was a beautiful uh, occasion, a beautiful experience. And at that occasion, on that occasion, I, uh, they mentioned this initiative uh, called May 12 and they encourage people to organize events all over the world. So I said, I should organize this also in Tampa. So I reached out a couple of colleagues. Uh, we start planning everything for May 12 in Tampa. It was, of course, a physical event. We would never be thinking about an online event. But then, you know, the story, how it goes, coronavirus outbreak, everything canceled. And also, we got discouraged. So we just gave up and we say, OK, we're going to do this next year. But then Taste of Science was uh, so nice to get in touch with me again because I have contacted them before. And so they asked me to, why we cannot have this uh, uh, event online? And uh, it's actually great because we can really reach people uh, all over the world now. And so this is why I am here today in front of you. So before starting going in the depth of my talk, I want to tell you why uh, this event is called May 12. So we, for that, we have to fly to Iran. Specifically, we have to fly to the capital of Iran, Tehran, and we have to go back of exactly 43 years. So we are on May 12, 1977, and this is the birthday of this little child. This little child is not me, I can guarantee, because I don't have blue eyes. This little child is Mario Mirzakani. And we are here in 1983, so uh, it was a picture of 1983. So when I think to the name Mario Mirzakani, I think that there are two hidden words. There is the word math and woman. Because uh, Maria Mirzakani was uh, a woman which was doing mathematics. So I will call her tonight just uh, Mariam, and I will not be talking about her life because uh, you will be able to see a more, a nicer experience, you know, you will have a more, a nicer experience discovering uh, her life uh, through the documentary at the end, but I will mostly focus on some mathematics uh, she was doing. So, when, if you were asking to a mathematician who is, uh, you know, which kind of mathematics she was doing, or to Wikipedia, you would most probably hear the words Riemann surfaces, hyperbolic geometry, moduli spaces. So I don't know your reaction behind your screen, but probably you say, what is this? And you have to know that these are very complicated words even for you know, a random mathematician, they would most probably not be able to tell you exactly what all these concepts mean in depth. So she was working with all these uh, kind of objects uh, or in these kind of fields of uh, uh, mathematics and uh, uh, for her achievement, uh, she got she awarded the Fields Metal in 2014 for her outstanding contribution to the dynamics and geometry of Riemann surfaces and their moduli spaces. 
So for people that are not very familiar with the field of mathematics, the field medal is the highest, uh, uh, the highest prize, let's say, in the world of mathematics, it's like the Nobel Prize, but there is not a Nobel Prize for mathematics. So, but there is a big difference that the field medal is basically given to young mathematicians because there is a limit of age of 40 years old. And so this was a, a, a very big achievement for the mathematical community and especially for the community of women in mathematics. Because, you know, when you have a champion, that champion can mostly, you know, inspire many other people to do the same thing. Imagine if in Italy, this is where I come from, there was a Roger Federer of tennis. Many other people, probably many other young girls and young boys would start doing the same. And this was a little bit Marian, I guess, for both women and Iranian people, because she was at the same time the first woman and the first Iranian so far to get to win a Fields medal, one out of 60. Okay, so tonight I want to present you a little bit uh, uh, some mathematics and I want to highlight what I found most beautiful in mathematics is when two areas which are completely unrelated, one from each other, there, you know, you can find a bridge be between them. And so tonight I will start from the word dynamics and show you how from there we can get to the world of Riemann surfaces. So to the world, to a more geometrical world. Okay, so for that, let me recall what is a dynamical system. So you will see here we have a Greek person. So she would tell us that uh, dynamical systems is, uh, comes, the, the word dynamic comes from, uh, uh, from Greek and basically means movement. So dynamical systems, a dynamical system is everything that concerns the movement of an object. So for instance, you can think to the movement of a planet in the solar system, but also to the movement of a particle inside a cloud chamber. So these lines that you see here, they, these points are not all particles. This is just the trajectory of a single particle in that chamber. Indeed, when you do dynamical system, you are concerned with the, the trajectories of these objects in the long term. So when basically t goes to infinity, we would say. Okay, but you don't have to go so big or so small in order to find a dynamical system. You have just to go to a bar. Well, I don't know if now they are open or not, wherever you are, but when they open, please go to a bar that has a billiard. And then you would do dynamical billiards. Okay, so I'm going to give you some tips on how to be successful, how to win at pool, okay? But uh, uh, I'm still put, trying to put, in, to put them in practice and I'm very good in the theory, you know, and less in the practice. So whenever you have a pool, your goal is to, put the, uh, to hit the ball and put it in a hole. So imagine now we select the right hand uh, the top right hand corner. Okay, we want to put our ball there. Then what we want to do, we want to hit our ball and the ball then uh, will take uh, its trajectory, which is a straight line. And we want that these straight lines goes from the initial position of the ball to the hole. So something like that. But you know, when you play pool many times, you have some obstructions. So, and probably also every other all you know, you cannot reach directly. So what you have to do, you have to select another hole that you can reach probably by, you know, reflecting your ball, bouncing your ball in one of the borders. So let's imagine that we want to put the ball now on the bottom right hand uh, corner. So in this case, normally what you try to do, you try to hit the ball against, uh, in this case, the top corner in a way that then when it bounces, bounces there. So you want to do something like this. But this is not random. There is a physical law that, uh, you know, uh, govern uh, this, uh, the trajectory of the, of the ball when it bounces against the border. And this is the same, it happens when the light uh, goes into, uh, the light goes into uh, a mirror. 
So what happens is that before the collision, you have an angle, which is called incidence angle, and that, that angle is the same as the reflecting angle, okay? So that one after collision. So these two angles are the same, and basically you have to find that point in the corner that will allow to put your ball exactly in the corner. But now let's go back to our mirror idea. So now I put it, the, our pool table a little bit smaller and I have colored my sides in different ways. There is a blue side, a yellow side and a, a white side. And then we have also a, a red side in, uh, uh, in the bottom. Okay, so imagine now that the blue side, so on the top, is a mirror. And imagine if you could go through that mirror. So you would see something like that. And this is not magic at all, this is math. So now what it was just a union of two segments be be becomes a straight line that brings your ball to basically the reflected hole. Okay, now this is a kind of complicated situation with all these balls in the middle, but uh, let's try to keep it simple. This is what a mathematician would do. And let's just consider now a pool without holes and just a ball. And now we are just interested in the possible, uh, all the possible trajectories of this ball. So let's imagine that we hit our ball so that the first, uh, you know, uh, the first part of the trajectory is like the pink one. Okay, for the rule that we just saw, basically when the balls hit the, uh, the border, then it reflects with the same angle and in the same time in the mirror, we would have something like that. Okay, now again, after the ball bounces uh, the white uh, border, well, it will follow a trajectory like that, and then on the top, we can actually do the same thing, thinking that now the, uh, the mirror is it, it is on the white side, okay? So we basically reflect that uh, pool table with respect to the white line. And we keep going a straight line. Okay, and then again, it bounces also uh, the, uh, the red uh, border. And now we have to see what happens for our orange trajectory. Well, do you know these games where you have a character that, uh, you know, moves in the, in, in his space and then when he goes in the top, he starts again from the bottom? And this is exactly what happens here. So imagine now we have this other square here and basically our line will reappear at the same, at the corresponding point A here and we will keep going like that. And in this way, these two points that you see on the left and on the right, so this point that I call B are also basically the same. So now, I don't know, uh, I hope that you can see my video. Please uh, let me know if you cannot see my videos because uh, I'm uh, showing something, uh, you know, uh, interactive. So I have basically made here a representation of this uh, of the situation that uh, you had basically in uh, in the on the screen so here you have a rectangle okay which has here an orange uh, a, a red border another red border a white uh, sorry yellow border another yellow border and then a white border and a blue border here blue line here let's say so now what we said that here these two points are basically the same Okay, and this is the same for, you know, every point, every couple of points here and here. So uh, think always uh, to our character that disappear in the top and reappear in the bottom. So basically what we are doing is basically identifying the points of these two sides. And you would get doing this, what is called the mathematics of cylinder. And you see here our original trajectory that does like this, when I identify those points, it becomes a line, okay? So starting from here becomes a, a line, which is actually a geodesic, it's called Imata geodesic, on our cylinder. And then I have to do the same for the, you know, uh, yellow border. Okay, this is kind of complicated to do because paper is not very flexible. So I should basically turn this 
like this in a way that they won't go together and you get you know kind of bagel or if you want if you prefer a donut you have to know that i had to go doing groceries for getting this today but this is what is called a toros so you see we started from a billiard table and basically we kind of uh, uh, di uh, did some geometrical transformation and we made it uh, a donut. And now our, the trajectory of our ball basically became a core, a geodesic on this uh, torus. And what Marian did in her work is basically to study this kind of geodesics and also considering other kind of pools of different shape, triangles, uh, pentagons, hexagons, and then doing this kind of work of reflection through mirrors, and then studying basically identifying uh, borders, and then studying the trajectory on those um, on those uh, geometrical shapes, which are called Riemann surfaces. And so, before going to you know the next part of this uh, uh, of this talk, I want to end mine with a quotation from uh, Maria Mirdakani that you will find again in the screen, in the film, sorry. The most satisfactory part of the teaching for me comes for this, from discussing things with students outside of the classroom, more than covering a certain material during the lecture. And this is basically, you know, I, find, uh, I found this uh, uh, quote so true. In my experience as a teacher, I loved meeting with my students during office hours and uh, some of them would still uh, keep coming sometimes after the end of the semester. So these students were mostly female students uh, who were asking for suggestions about uh, some specific choices they had to make, uh, probably future classes, uh, internships, uh, but Sometimes they wanted just me to share my personal experience as a mathematician, as a woman, as a teacher. So I don't know why they chose me, but is it possible that they took me as their role model? So in conclusion, my personal opinion and my message today also is that when you hire a woman or you give an award to a woman or you promote a woman, you're not ju doing just for her, but you're especially doing it for all those uh, young uh, generations that uh, would take her as uh, their role model. So diversity, and not just about you know, gender, the gender point of view, is, is important in every context, not only mathematics, because basically it gives the possibility to everyone to dream. So, this is what I wanted to say in my talk. And now for kind of uh, giving a little bit more, you know, sharing more experience of uh, women in mathematics, uh, women mathematicians, I'm going to stop my screen. And uh, I brought with me some uh, friends, colleagues, students, uh, they could a little bit give also, send a message or just uh, talk about their experience, uh, their math, and uh, uh, so I want to ask to uh, the first pet people I brought here just for connecting with my talk, which is Laura. She, is a, she was a, a very, very good student uh, in my course of Bridge to Abstract Mathematics. And uh, nothing, when I asked her, you know, why she chose me, uh, as a as her instructor, basically, she told me that uh, because I was the only woman, you know, giving that uh, uh, teaching that course. So probably she's a good representative here of a probably future woman mathematician. So Laura, if you uh, if you can uh, put your microphone on, and now sorry, I have to switch before to uh, you know several things here. But meanwhile, you can probably introduce yourself and I'm going to put uh, everything here for you. Okay, so hi, my name is Laura. I'm a student, as Dr. Yetzi said, I had the pleasure of taking her class last semester or this semester. And 
it was one of the best experiences having a female professor just because as I'm sure many of the people who are majoring in math or STEM can say, it's very hard to come by. And today I'm talking a little bit about Julia Robinson. She was a very famous mathematician in the 1960s. And she accomplished a lot of things um, for a woman during that time. For instance, she was a member of the math department at the National Academy of Science. She was the first female president of the American uh, math Association, and she's a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship. But more than that, she always claimed that she didn't want to be known as being like the first woman for doing this or that. She wanted to be, as any mathematician should, recognized because of her theorems and stuff she had proved. And I feel like that talks a lot, a lot about women and their position in the math department and overall in the field. I believe that a lot of us struggle with never seeing a math professor that's a female and never really knowing someone that we can talk to about not being as understood as males. And I believe that for a student, it's very important having a female professor because it encourages you to follow your passions, to follow your dreams, to know that it is possible to be a woman in math and be happy. And that's one of the things um, very happy that I took Dr. Yetzi for the class because she really inspired me to continue my dreams before I had a lot of doubts about pursuing math, but meeting someone that's as passionate about that as you are really, really encourages you to continue. And the quote I chose from Julia Robinson reads, I like to think of mathematics as forming a nation of our own without distinctions of your geographical origin race, creed, sex, age, or even time, all dedicated to the most beautiful of the arts and sciences. So I decided to pick this one because, well, I'm an international student, I'm a female, and I believe that it, that shouldn't matter. If you like to pursue math as a profession or even as a hobby, there should be nothing that stops you from it. And it's nice to meet someone and people that just share your same feelings, especially if they've gone through the same things or have gone through things you haven't and can give you valuable advice. Okay, thanks Clara for the nice words. I really didn't want you to, <laughs> to say that, but uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, so this was the experience of a student. Uh, uh, and now I, I wanted also to give you a little bit more variety. So I will go a little bit through the career of a woman in mathematics and probably the next step would be a PhD students. So I chose as a PhD students to invite here tonight my academic sister. So basically we are also relations like daughter, son, and uh, mothers, fathers in academia. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, your, uh, your advisor would be your father or your mother. And in this case, uh, me and Elena, that we were both studying in France, in Marseille, uh, we have the same supervisor. So I will uh, put your quote here, Elena, and then- you Thank you, Anna. Okay, so good everyone. Good evening, everyone. And uh, well, thank you for being here. And of course, I would like to thank Anna and all the staff of Taste of Science for organizing this event and inviting me to talk. So as Anna said, I am a PhD student in mathematics in France, uh, Tête Marseille University. And more or less 20 years ago, a very famous and skilled mathematician did a research stay in the same lab where I am finishing my PhD. I'm talking about Christine Lothar, who is principal researcher and partner research manager for the cryptography and privacy research group at Microsoft. She is also a co-founder of the Women in Numbers Network, which is a research collaboration community for women in number theory. And tonight I want to share with you a quote from an interview of Christine of 2018 that you can also see on the screen, which say, I think that there is a great place for women to help us solve our challenges in science. I am particularly disturbed by the low numbers that we still see for women in scientific career. So that's the problem I like to solve. Well, let me say that I choose to talk about Christine for at least two reasons. 
First, uh, she was the first mathematician of whom I read a paper in my field that I found so interesting and well written that made me say, I want to write a paper like this. And also, I want to be like her. So basically, she was the first role model I had within mathematics. Secondly, I chose her because I think that we and the new generation of women need living examples of great women in mathematics. So why I'm saying so? If you think of other fields rather than mathematics like sport or cinema, for instance, your idol, your role model in general is a living person. You want to be like her or like him. And in my field, it is the same. People don't say that they want to be like Gauss or Pythagora that are very known, but also dead. They say that they want to be like some winner of the Fields Medal that Hannah told about before as Andrew Wiles, for instance, or they want to be the winner of another famous mathematical prize. However, when a mathematician wants to give an example of a woman in, in mathematics, they always refer to women who have lived 100 years ago or more. And I think, for instance, about Sophie Germain or Emily Noether, uh, who were, of course, great mathematicians and are great examples of, of women in uh, mathematics. But also, they lived and worked one or 200 years ago. They were first to hide themselves, pretend to be men in order to work. And even when they can prove their worth, they were seen as particular cases. So I think that what we need now is to keep in mind examples of successful women in uh, mathematics nowadays. And Christine Lothar is, of course, one of them. And finally, let me say that I choose this quote also because in my, in my opinion, it is crucial that mathematicians who have an important uh, role, like Christine, point out that the lack of women in scientific career is a real issue. I mean, if we had more women in math, we will have different and beautiful minds solving our scientific problems. And probably we will also have different points of view on old and new problems in math. Christine said that the lack of women in scientific career is a problem she'd like to solve. And from the point of view of a mathematician, let me say that you can be sure that when we say that we want to solve a problem, we try and we keep on trying until it is solved. So for tonight, I want to be optimistic. Let's say that this problem will be soon solved. And I want to be optimistic about this. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for uh, your intervention, your quotes. I know Christine Lauter personally, so she was in the first picture because she is the founder of the Women in Number, like say, movement. So uh, yes, definitely she did nice things for women in mathematics. So now I want to go a little bit, uh, uh, basically I want to introduce the next colleagues of mine. So if there are some colleagues which, which are here from USF, they will probably recognize some also ex-colleagues of them. And uh, so I want to introduce Mirto. So we, do, we did not, we were not just colleagues, we were, uh, were also roommates, so I know her very well. She is not like my academic sister, but still like a sister, uh, even though we are both, uh, uh, you know, only child, you say in English probably. And, uh, uh, and nothing, where is uh, Mirto? I don't see her. Here I am, so we're... Oh, okay, here you are. Okay, yeah. great. So, and, uh, hi, Anna. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so with Anna, practically, we were academically married. We were roommates, office mates, uh, <laughs> going for trips together. I had the good fortune spending two years in USF in Tampa, where I did my postdoc with Professor Beneteau. And actually, I have to tell you that I decided to become a mathematician when I was 12 years old. Um, 
And the person who inspired me was, uh, prof uh, was a, a female professor who said to my mother that your daughter will become a scientist. The problem was that this professor was a professor of English. <laughs> Probably she said that because I had no hopes with English. Uh, however, uh, I decided to become a mathematician when I was 12 years old. Uh, and Anne asked me to uh, collect something that inspired me to become uh, a mathematician. The reason is why I become a mathematician is that we had an essay to write what job we will select when we grow up. I said a mathematician and then because I don't want to say lies I had to follow this. Uh, anyway, I love mathematics. Uh, I have, uh, I am from Greece, uh, by the way I put some background to indicate this. And the quote I, I, uh, I chose, so Anna has to show this quote now, uh, is supposed to belong to a very uh, important mathematician, actually the first female mathematician, uh, Ipatia. Uh, so Ipatia was a Greek mathematician, Greek Egyptian mathematician. She lived around uh, 350 and she died in 415. Uh, she lived in Al Alexandria of Egypt in a very, very um, difficult period because there were certain religious groups, there were Jewish people, there were Christian people, there were people believing in idols. So the, the situation was very um, difficult. But she had the good fortune to be a daughter of uh, a mathematician, Theon, who uh, uh, actually he wrote uh, a version of Euclid's elements. He's, he's known for this. Uh, and Ipatia had the fortune to, to be educated because the law uh, back there, it wasn't the Roman, uh, the law of the Roman Empire, it was a mixture of law, so, so women could be educated uh, exceptionally. She went to Athens, she went to Italy, she studied mathematics and she returned to Alexandria uh, where she taught uh, mathematics, uh, philosophy. Uh, in particular, she was the president of the Neoplatonic philosophy school. And she also uh, was an astronomer. Uh, so we haven't seen her work. Uh, we have reference, many references from her work. And she's very well known to be a very inspirational uh, teacher. In fact, I, I, uh, people say that uh, she, she had communications with the people who built the Astrolab, which is Astrolab, which is the, is, let's say, the first ancient computer in some sense. Uh, I, uh, I don't know what is correct and what is wrong, because when you read things in the internet, you have to be very skeptical. But I found that a quote, which is attributed to her, is uh, the following one. Reserve your right to think, for even to think wrongly is better not to think at all. And this quote is really inspi it inspires me, reflects at least my own point of view. Uh, because I, I have thought about a thousand students in my life and I see this all the time. Several students and most of them female students hesitate to express their thoughts uh, because they're afraid they are wrong. So my advice to the younger generations is you should not be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes is the best way to educate ourselves. And this is a quote that I also say to myself when I do research. There are many times that I, I am afraid of expressing something if it is wrong. And that's why I felt so happy when I arrived uh, in Florida and I had a female supervisor who made me feel so comfortable. And uh, doing mathematics with her was one of the most enjoyable experiences in my life. So I really hope that uh, one day we will not have to celebrate International uh, Day for Women because equality will be given. So that's my message and uh, thank you very much for... How for do you say in Greek? Which one? Uh, goodbye. Adio, bye bye. <laughs> we say also bye bye. Okay. bye, -bye. That's boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Mirto. Anyway, yes, I want to kind of, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to stop the, the screening, the, the, the sharing of my screening. And uh, yes, it's very important for younger generation, in my opinion, to always ask questions and also ask suggestions, talk with people about what we can, they can do, they can, where they can go, where, 
you know, because the pro most pro they cannot know everything. So for sure, if they ask to their professor for tips, you know, about what, how they can kind of uh, follow the dream. So this is a good suggestion to all the students that I don't know if uh, today we are uh, listening to us or probably in the recording. And then at this point, I would also like to do, introduce our next speaker. And she will bring us a different point of view on mathematics because what we did so far, even though it seems applied because you kind of, uh, you know, hit a ball on, uh, on a billiard, but then it becomes directly super pure mathematics because you study these Riemann surfaces and these curves, okay? So she will bring us a little bit more the point of view of applied mathematics and uh, indeed she applies mathematics to health and disease uh, in a kind of field that uh, requires a, a lot of collaboration creativity with people from uh, the you know different areas biology medicine computer science and also mathematics so uh, to be more precise the main focus is uh, building and analyzing spatial simulations, connecting mathematical models to data and communicating complex and abstract ideas through art and design. So here for you is Jill. Hi. So let's see, let me share this. Oops. Yes. While you share, I want to rem uh, recall to all the audience that at the end you know, of the talk of Jill, we will have a session of question and answers. So uh, we will be all there, me included, and all the panelists and Jill. So, but now it's time to Jill. So, you know, we want to see what you are, have to say tonight. Great, can you see this? Yes. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I just wanted to uh, kind of give my perspective on, on math and, and uh, applied math. And so I wanted to start off with some of Mercy Kani's work, but uh, just very basically. So if you've ever looked at a flight path, you see these crazy curved surfaces, or these curved trajectories, right? And you look at that and say, how could that be possible? You've got this blue line, and this is somehow shorter than this red line just, just goes straight across. Uh, and and that sure makes a lot of sense if you're looking at this world in this way, but then you start to remember that you are on a curved surface. And when you start to project it onto the reality of the sphere, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, and then you start to look back at the map and you say, well, how did you create this map in the first place of projecting this 3D surface onto this 2D plane? And you realize that all maps are really just a distortion of reality. You're, you're abstracting the, the reality to convey a particular message. And that's really all mathematical models are, is you're, you're abstracting a system to, to convey a message. And, uh, but Mirza Khani was not interested exactly in just spheres. These were the kind of shapes she was looking at. And it gets a lot more complicated when you start to, to deal with surfaces with holes in it, the donut or the torus, or many holes or these saddle shapes. But I have to say, looking through here, the very best surface that I've ever seen are this, this pair of pants surface. So some of the stuff that she was working on is describing these geometries by separating in, them into many different pairs of pants. So you can see if you look at the picture on the left, if you're to take these two pairs of pants, put the belts together and then zip the cuffs together, you get now a two-hold torus. But that's just the start of things. So she was looking at very complicated surfaces that can be decomposed into many pairs of pants. Uh, she would doodle these things all over and I really thought it was endearing. Her daughter described her, her mom's work as painting and I really, it struck me that she described herself as a slow mathematician. And I connected with this because I've always thought of myself as a slow mathematician and that that was a negative thing. But then she 
put it in this light that you have to spend some energy and effort to see the beauty of math. And I think that really takes that slowness and puts it in as an asset. And you start to realize that taking the time to slow down and really truly understand something is, is beautiful and, and makes it fun. And uh, she was a pure mathematician, so she didn't necessarily care about applications, but there are plenty of applications that come from all these things that mathematicians are doing. One of the coolest things that I saw that came from the pair of pants is registering an entire surface of the human brain by decomposing it into many multiple pairs of pants, which is so cool. Um, and the other beautiful thing is, is, you know, that math is this great integrator that, you know, when you start to see math as, as a tool and you start to see math as, as uh, you know, quant quantifying actual things in, in nature, you start to see that all of these things are connected through abstraction and rules and, uh, you know, just laws. And so, this is not always how we see it, uh, how it's presented to us when we do enter university. This is how it was presented to me. So you see these kind of siloed departments that, that don't really c connect or communicate with each other. But you know, for me, that was okay because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And I wanted to go into medicine. You know, I was curious, I loved biology. I started at the University of Missouri as a biology major, getting into, uh, getting into pre-med classes. Uh, but what happened was, is I, I started taking these classes and I had to take a physics class and I was completely hooked. So uh, I knew that this was the direction that I needed to go. I started to understand that there's these fundamentals of nature that can be described in terms of the framework of equations and math and and you can understand this everything in a deeper level uh, so but I didn't know what I was going to do with that so my first thought is to take my background in art and try to learn about architecture try to have this melding of form and function using math and science and physics and art but I started to continue to take physics classes and then I realized well I can get into biophysics this is a thing and I joined a biophysics lab and I went and got my PhD in biomedical physics at East Carolina University and then I went on for a postdoc and I found this wonderful group uh, Moffitt Cancer Center the Department of Integrated Mathematical Oncology and it's just this it's not just the department but the whole institute we form these collaborations where everybody has their methods and they're working on one thing is to understand cancer and i even found a way to bring in my art because when you're really talking about these complex and abstract ideas being able to visualize it and show that to somebody really helps uh convey the message and so you start to realize that if you really want to connect these different silos that you have to take a chance and be wrong and, and possibly fall. So you can start to, to connect all these separate silos. And so now this is what I have been doing for the past nine years is really uh, learning how to abstract the, the biology, learning how to use data, uh, learning how cancer progresses, progresses how it interacts with normal tissue and how different tumors respond to different therapies and different treatment schedules. And I usually uh, I found kind of a niche in, in using these spatial simulations and in, in trying to describe all these cells that make up a whole tumor. But this is kind of complicated, so let me move to something simpler. This thing that I'm gonna call the little ball factory. So what's going on here is you have all these individual moving parts, all these processes that are working together in concert, and it's a complex system. So there's different ways that you can start to understand it. 
And maybe what you do is you start to look deeper at one little part. And so what happens is, is you could start to amplify that little bit. And what happens, maybe nothing. So you start to say, well, maybe this can be neglected or ignored. But then you see another part here that is a critical point at which a bottleneck is occurring. And if you start to disturb that point, everything starts to fail. And so you can understand the little pieces of the system. Maybe you're the manager of this factory and you need to understand the system as a whole. So you can start to look at the little inputs and the outputs and start to quantify and abstract it in that way so that you get a big picture view, but you don't need to concern yourself with every little detail and every little part. And maybe you're just a stockholder that wants to know how this company is doing. And so now you abstract the system. All you want to know is the rate of production, the money going in and the money coming out. All of these ways are different ways that you can abstract a system, create a mathematical model and try to predict things, no matter how complicated it is. And so this kind of gets to the art of abstraction. Now, let's say that I wanted to send out a Valentine and I sent one with the picture on the left. This might be considered a threat. Now, if I sent the one on the right, it just might get confusing, but somehow this one in the middle has the right amount of, of abstraction that it just conveys love, right? We can also go back to maps and understand that reality and too much abstraction is not useful, but the way that you start to zoom in on certain parts of a complicated system and zoom out on others is distorting it in such a way that makes it uh, useful. And I can't not talk about this little thing, this little virus that has caused so much chaos, this thing that's a fraction of a micron, but it doesn't exist at just the scale. We also have uh, we also have the inflammation that's occurring in lung tissues and we have individuals and how how this virus affects them and then you have the whole population now you could take any one of these parts or the whole thing and start to start to try to understand it through math and try to answer specific questions and build build your model around this uh, the one though the one model that is getting so much attention in the news is this one and it's because it really shows something that communicates a message that's useful. And so this is the SIR model that basically takes the whole population and splits them into little pieces. The population of susceptible, those that are infected and those that have recovered and no longer are, are susceptible. And so why this has gotten so much attention is because while we might not be able to do anything about this rate B here, there's a lot that can happen to slow down this rate A. And this is where interventions have been implemented. And this is the communication that's been presented to the public. Uh, and so, so it's, it's really interesting to see that these, these models are getting a lot of attention and Anybody can play with these models, but really to kind of dig into it and really feel like there's accuracy in prediction, you have to work with epidemiologists and virologists and even economists to try to understand this really complicated problem. And so I just wanted to give one take home message here. And it's that math is useful and math is creative. And if you take Miriam's words, to just be slow and play and have fun and really understand what's going on in the world. So that's it. Yes, thank you very much, Jill. So uh, now I think, Parmi, uh, uh, I let you, you know, keep going with the show. <laughs> Absolutely. Um... So I think we're going to try and get everybody up on the panel. And first of all, because the audience, you can't see them giving you a round of applause. I feel like we should all give each other a round of applause. That was awesome. Very much appreciated everyone sharing their experience. And um, we love the quotes. And Jill, your explanations of kind of your work and the, how they are applicable to real life were really wonderful. 
Um, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask, uh, and obviously there are, the Q&A is open to anyone to participate right now. Um, I, I feel like it's still at school level, a lot of um, particularly young girls still don't seem to be as drawn to math as other subjects potentially. Now, I was only one of two girls who went to like the, the upper level in high school um, out of a class of maybe 12 people. And it feels like that's still a very common occurrence. Do you think there's any way that you could, um, if you had a magic wand and you could attract more girls into math, what do you think you would do? Well, first of all, organizing such kind of events is always, uh, you know, nice for showing us. Uh, it's basically giving visibility, I guess, uh, to to women in mathematics. And uh, um, I, you know, I am still in a stage where, you know, going to my academic career. But probably we have to convince really that uh, it's good to have. Uh, and this was my message, basically. It's good to have more women in our departments so that, uh, as Laura was saying, more students could <laughs> choose uh, their classes. And then I don't know if anybody else could, uh, you know, want to add something. Yeah, maybe at, uh, organizing events with very attractive men could also work. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just thinking alternative. Uh, but I have to say that I see indeed in the academic career less and less women pass to the next stage. I mean, there are definitely practical issues like uh, having a family, babies, and all these things. Uh, but I think that the women that survive are very strong personalities and very um, dynamic people, like Anna, for example, who can convince you to give a talk the next uh, minute. She's very powerful. She organizes uh, events uh, in France. Uh, also in S South Florida, Natasha and Catherine, the two professors we have in the math departments, are really role models. So I think um, an idea also, if we start opening positions, instead of saying generically uh, we should promote women, priority will be given to women, maybe we should study the criteria and which areas women are better than men. For example, I think women generically are more devoted in teaching. They, they love communicating. Uh, I don't know, maybe these are a little bit stereotypical. I'm not sure if they are correct or, or wrong. Uh, but I think putting emphasis in criteria that they also support women could be a part of the solution. That's my... There is, a, there is an interesting question, and uh, probably, Elena, you are the best to answer to this uh, here, because I lived a little bit both the European and the American experience. So they ask us, uh, are European countries more successful in supporting young women mathematicians? Yes. Okay, well, uh, I don't have this experience in the US, so it's difficult to say if uh, in Europe it is easier or not for a uh, for young mathematician if we have more support or not. So probably so, me that I have lived, you know, experienced both, mm -hmm. I said that there is more attention here uh, than uh, in Europe. But uh, maybe the problem but, is bigger in the United States. So, I mean, I, I've thought, okay, I've thought in Canada, United States, Ireland and China. So the Easter, the better well in some sense so okay. in china they, they had equality women had uh, powerful roles as managers uh, professors uh, i think in europe there are several laws pr protecting for example you have to uh, have 25 percent female speakers so when you want to organize a conference getting some grants so i think also in europe they they push the boundaries as well so yeah, it's kind of hard to give a click, you know, clear. There are statistics it's a problem but, everywhere. <laughs> but my feeling, at least from my little experience in the West, is that uh, the problem is far bigger there. That's why the interest is far bigger in solving the problem, uh, I think. In physics, it's really pretty bad, at least when I was there last. I, I don't spend a whole lot of time in physics departments now, but. Uh, 
yeah, there's, and there's no turnover really either. So it's, it, it remains small and hard to get in uh, from, what I, from yeah. what I remember. Somebody's asking also about computer science. I, I think that over there, the percentage of women is even less than in other, uh, than in other, uh, in mathematics, for instance. But, uh, you know, today, tonight we didn't want to bring really statistics because you, you can find this, uh, you know, in many places. And uh, we want it mo mostly to be, I think, your, you know, your speaker women and uh, mathematicians. So there was a, um, a question from David who uh, directs this to Jill. You talk about the importance of your artistic side on your mathematical work. Is that a common thing among mathematicians? Um, you know, I don't know. I think, I think it could be. I, I don't, I, I don't really hear about it much, but I think it makes a lot of sense, especially when you start to think about the, these abstract ideas, maybe everybody does it differently, but you, I have to, I have to draw this stuff down sometimes. And maybe, maybe other people work in their head or work differently. So maybe not, but, um, I, I have always found that that visualization is the way that I think, and so I try to project that to other people uh, to try to communicate, but um, I don't know. What about everybody else on the panel? Because obviously, Anna, we mentioned earlier that you have your, um, you created these mathematical musicals. Tell us more about those. I'm really intrigued. Yeah, the goal of those musicals was really to reach uh, everybody. So we wanted to make, uh, math fun and accessible to everyone you know without the, like we said any distinction to from children to you know the uh, all this part of the population we wanted something to be free and uh, actually we spent a lot of time looking for fundings uh, for making it uh, you know possible it's kind of expensive to organize this in a theater uh, so our goal was really to allow people to think to mathematics like something which is not just for few ones, which is probably the impression that many people have when they hear the word mathematics. This is not for me. I'm not good in mathematics. How many times I heard that mm -hmm. from students? And I always said everyone is good in mathematics as long as they are interested in it. So if you're not interested in something, you will never be good, this is my idea. Yeah. Anybody else? Do you have a creative outlet? Oh, Mirto is very creative. <laughs> yeah, I want to know what that stringed instrument is behind. Sorry. It's Anna. I have convinced Anna that I'm creative. It's not that I'm creative, but I doodle all the time. That's the proof. So, <laughs> when I do mathematics, it's 90% doodling uh, and 10% mathematics. Yeah, you will see also that uh, Maria Mirzakani was uh, kind of doing her drawing also in paper in the documentary that will uh, follow uh, soon. And so she was basically writing, uh, you know, all these surfaces, uh, small questions. So it was kind of interesting uh, also this visualization of mathematics. So I think actually we were going to start the movie at eight. What do you think, Anna? Yeah, I think we are ready to go and uh, if, uh, yeah. So, uh, of course, one final time, thank you so much to all of our guests for being with us today. Um, you've been a tremendous inspiration, at least to the messages I've been seeing from my colleagues in other channels. Um, and yes, I mean, much like every other field, it's, it's important to say that we need equity in all of these fields. Um, so I will try and set this up. So the slight issue we might have with the film is that we're not quite sure how well this is going to stream online. Um, we're keeping our fingers crossed it's going to be okay. But if not, uh, we will be sharing a link with people who've attended um, so that you can uh, watch the movie another time in a higher quality uh, when you would like. Yeah, so I want just to probably thank you everyone for staying with us until the, the very end. I hope you enjoyed the videos. You know, the first time I saw it, I cried at the end. And 
Uh, anyway, this was uh, our way of sharing a little bit of uh, mathematics with you. And uh, Fami, do you want to say something else? Uh, just to say the same, a beautiful film um, to clearly a beautiful person and amazing work. Um, yeah, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. If you have a minute to fill out our survey at the end, that would be wonderful. But um, otherwise, have a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. Yes, bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.